No one completely understands Fule Kuli, not even myself. It's simply impossible. Although Fuli Kuli has been popularly believed to be a coming-of-age anime, I sort of disagree. I think the term coming-of-age is exactly the opposite of what FLCL is about, although admittedly it does have the same qualities of a coming-of-age anime. Throughout its six-episode runtime, there is no shortage in newness, in weirdness, in what the f ness It is probably the single anime that expresses without restraint the absolute fun of animation. Fully Coolie is one of the medium-defining anime out there. It may not have reached the popularity of or any other groundbreaking mecha shows that came out after it, but for the lot of people who did watch it, it is something that left its mark on them. Don't get me wrong, there are people who complain about its incohesive narrative and its jarring all over the place-ness, but that's the mistake of the viewer, you see. Fully Cooley is deliberately incohesive. It is deliberately nonsensical. And to the people who believe that it is deliberately like that because it has some deep meaning behind it, I just have this to say. Please, get a job. Your mother wants to let you know that your birth was a mistake. Now I'm going to go ahead and derive a deep meaning from it so that I can be smart on the internet. I see that all across the internet when discussing Fully Cooley or more specifically when recommending Fully Cooley to someone, it goes something like this. Fully Cooley is bizarre and illogical and a cartoonish show with full of dumb stuff happening it's really weird and stupid and also a coming of age story. <laughs> see how quirky it is? Yeah, anime slaps. Mmm, watch it. Although that's what I've been trying to do so far, I'd like to explore why or how Fully Cooley is a coming of age anime or, well, how it's not a coming of age anime and what Fully Cooley has to say about coming of age or growing up and how it teaches you to grow up. Or at least why I think it has to say because it's art and this is my opinion or like my interpretation and you know, the death of the author and stuff, so. Part 1. A Gainax Anime Fully Cooley is a 6 episode OVA about Nawata, an elementary schooler who's busy trying to be a cool adult. It's a coming of age story, sort of, where the main character learns valuable lessons that lead him to becoming a grown-up. It is also a sci-fi with an alien girl who whacks Nauta on the head with a blue Rickenbacker 4001, causing him to transport humanoid robots from his head, out of which one ends up as Nauta's house, maid, taker, care. It's also a comedy with jokes and references packed tightly together and delivered at an intense pace. It is a total rejection of genre norms and archetypes. And this rejection can be also seen with the story of its production. Fully Cooley was produced by one of the monoliths of the industry, that was Studio Gainax. Gainax is a studio made for otakus by otakus. It's humble beginnings of some unknown talented university students coming together to produce an ambitious animated short for an SF convention is awe-inspiring and also sort of comedic think about it. The Daikon 3 and 4 opening animations were produced by a group of around 8 university students, among which the most renowned being Hideaki Anno for his directorial work on... nope, not yet. This video is not about Giant Actors' backstory or about Anno, but as someone who has an irrational amount of appreciation for both Gainax and its productions, I cannot understate how much you should watch the hours upon hours worth of their story, or better yet, the work they produced from the 80s to most of the 2000s, by which most of its big players left the studio. However, for now, I'm not that kind of a channel. But it is around the late 80s when Gainax started his production on Nadia, The Secret of Blue Water. It would turn out to be Gainax's biggest success until a certain show would come around. It was a rather sizable task and required new recruits. Kazuya Tsurumaki saw this opportunity and joined Gainax. And this is the main character of this video. This is the guy who'd go on to co-direct the end of Ava and eventually fully direct Fully Cooley. The reason why I fixated on Gainax is that 
Holy Cooly is a Gainax anime to its very core. To illustrate this, let's look at the first animated short by the early Gainax team being Daikon 3 and 4 opening animations. They are bizarre as hell. They follow a young schoolgirl as she is handed a glass of water which she proceeds to run with and encounter various out of place looking monsters and mechs and somehow she doesn't spill a drop of that water and at the end of Daikon 3 she reaches a desert where there is a daikon radish and she pours the water on it and it transforms into a huge radish shaped spaceship and in Daikon 4, she wears a bunny girl costume and fights various kaiju and also Darth Vader before jumping on a sword and surfing through the sky on, passing through various otaku stuff and also early comic book characters like Superman, Captain America, and Batman before finally the cityscape explodes to form beautiful mountains and a crowd of different characters from Superman to Doraemon to the Power Rangers to Wonder Woman to Lum from Urusei Yatsura and loads more that I cannot even begin to recognize come together to form the Daikon 4 logo. If you don't get the idea of what I'm trying to convey with my voice, uh, it felt spontaneous and fun and youthful and illogical and I love it. Also, it was very outlandish and eccentric. They were not concerned with cohesion or narrative, they just wanted to make something cool. They didn't add Darth Vader fighting the bunny girl because it serves some deeper narrative about the dark secrets of the human collective consciousness, but because they liked it. And I think you can see why I say that FLCL is a Gainax anime. It is literally alike to this early Gainax style in that it too is packed densely with culturally significant references and gags. In fact, I'm pretty sure that I didn't even get over 70% of the total references in the show. Hell, I didn't even recognize the Ashitano Joe reference even after re-watching it twice for this video. Legs spread, same width as the shoulders. Body tight, then hit the ball like you're defeating the enemy. Here, the pinky finger is the key. The opening lines of FLCL are taken from the boxing advice given in Ashitano Joe by Tange Danpei to, well, Joe. I only got the reference after I read it on a forum discussing references in FLCL and one guy replies, Really? I thought she was trying to teach Naota about sex. D. Similarly, the second time I watched FLCL, I got the Lupin the Third reference when Naota's father puts on a red suit and asks him if he prefers the green version. What's with those clothes? Ah, this red jacket you mean? What? Do you prefer the green one, Naota? Hmm? Hmm? Because I didn't know about Lupin the Third the first time I watched FLCL, and so I feel like. If I go back to FLCL every couple of months, I may end up unpacking a whole new reference I hadn't known before, which is really cool if you ask me. Also, why do you think Haruko rides a yellow Vespa and uses a blue Rickenbacker 4001 to fight? It's pretty simple, because Tsurumaki thought that yellow Vespas and guitars were cool. That's, that's it. What we need to realize is that when analyzing this anime, it's not the same as analyzing other anime. This anime is filled to its brim with stuff that Tsurumaki and the cast thought was cool, like the pillows. Fully Cooly was in part produced by a record label. So normally, the record studio would use anime to promote their new idols. But Tsurumaki wanted to get the pillows to do the music for FLCL because the pillows were his favorite band. And that's another thing. Fully Cooly's music elevates its atmosphere to a whole another level. In my previous video, I talked about how you feel nostalgia for a past you have never experienced. And Fully Cooly is one such anime that evokes this sensation. The Pillows' grunge music, along with FLCL's angsty visuals, gives it an atmosphere that I can only describe as 2000's childhood. Except I've never really had that. Fully Cooly is also a giant homage to the studio itself. For example, in my second favorite episode from the show entitled Full Swing, Haruko dresses up in a red bunny girl costume and rides her bass guitar while fighting the huge boner mecha hand cowboy thing that came out of Naoto's forehead. A big question that's asked when discussing Fully Cooly is 
why is it like that? Why stuff your directorial debut with different random references and gags and an incohesive narrative? And the answer to this, in part, goes to Neon Genesis. Uh, what was that again? Evan Jelion. Evan Jelion's success, although a good thing for Gainax, shook the world of anime. Fans were not all pleased with the ending of the original series. Hell, the series itself was criticized as being hard to understand. Anno had created a story that managed to actually emotionally assault its audiences. The reason he could do it was through making Shinji a sort of a self-insert. Can you do this to me? I thought you didn't want me. Why? Why did you have to call me now, father? Because I have a use for you. Tsunamaki said that Shinji being summoned by his father to pilot the Ava was like Anno being summoned by Gainax to direct Evangelion after he left the team during Nadia's production almost five years ago from then. Anno was not looking for a story that would inspire the otakus. What he wanted to do was to make a story for who they actually were, that being weak, socially inept, and even childish people much like himself. At that time in Japan, most families were similar in that the father of the family were usually workaholic salarymen who were mostly absent from the child's life. Tsurumaki himself stated that it was the case for his own family. Such a vulnerable anime touched the heart of millions, maybe not in the way they particularly wanted it to. Tsurumaki was given the co-director seat for the end of Evangelion. Although the end was an overwhelming success, the fans were not happy. They made the ending of the original series an inconclusive and a melancholic one because they felt that the triumphant happy ending that were the convention were just too used. The fans did not like this at all, and the end did not change this fact either. A couple of years later, Anno would declare that Tsurumaki was next, and Tsurumaki would be given the director seat for an anime he wanted to do. After even more months of not deciding on what to make, Fully Cooly began production. As Carl Gustav Horn, the editor for the Ava manga for the English language once wrote, how do you follow Evangelion? Easy. Get its assistant director to beat it to death with a baseball bat. Tsurumaki wanted to make something as different and as contrasting as possible to Evangelion. According to him, many people said that to understand Evangelion, you needed to be smart. But in understanding fully coolly, it was okay to feel stupid. And so Tsurumaki embarked on creating something that would juxtapose Evangelion in every possible way. This attitude is also reflected by the rest of the crew. Hideaki Anno went from Tsurumaki's superior on the production of The End to the role of key animator for 5 out of 6 episodes. Hiromasa Ogura, the art director for Fully Coolie, also had to drastically adapt to the show's ideals. His prior works such as Ghost in the Shell and Pat Labor had incredible cityscapes with towering forests of futuristic buildings and vast highways. However, in Fully Coolie, he could no longer play to his strengths, as Fully Coolie is entirely based on a small suburban town surrounded by mountains and engulfed by an ominous yellow sky. Yoshiyuki Sadamoto, the character designer for Avenged Lion, wanted to drastically change his own way of working, because although Ava was financially successful, he felt artistically unfulfilled. Tsurumaki wanted to explore his own self, and also the otaku public, just like Anno did, but instead of an end of the world suffocating and, and a violent brain blunder like Evangelion, Tsurumaki chose to approach it in a small town, bizarre and comedic eyebrow razor that being fully coolly. So from the very beginning, fully coolly set out to do something far different from Evangelion but something that they hoped would impact the audiences all the same. Also, I just realized they said Evangelion instead of Evangelion. I can't even keep saying it for a joke. It's that cursed. Anyways, now I should really start to talk about the show itself. Um, I don't believe there's such thing as spoiling Fully Coolie because as I said before, Fully Coolie is incohesive and I don't think anyone really understands it even after watching it, I don't know, like five times. But if you still are petty enough to care about that stuff, I'd proceed with caution. So yeah, 
moderate spoilers for Full Equally Ahead. With that said, Part 2. Making Sense of the Madness Fully Cooly, in my opinion, is not about coming of age. Here, I'm talking about the literal meaning of coming of age, that being attaining a certain age, usually 18. That is, becoming an adult. But Fully Cooly is not about becoming one, but rather a critique of adulthood itself. And with its critique, it also gives you a journey of Friedrich Nietzsche's self-overcoming. Yeah, I had to link vague philosophical ideas by old philosophers with some kids' cartoon. Nietzsche, for those of you who don't know, is the famous mustache guy who's considered the best girl of the third season of German philosophy idols, the anime, produced by Studio Bones. Or, well, it was in German, so it's called Studio Knochen. I sincerely apologize. Fully Cooly opens with the shaggy zoomed in shot of the mountains surrounding Mabase, the town the show takes place in, and its small houses and also the bridge Mamimi and Nauta are sitting beneath. Already the show builds a dreamy, strange, and perhaps a little nostalgic aesthetic, something that I can only liken to the glowing white sky of Shadow of the Colossus. The show is quick to establish its characters. As I mentioned before, this opening monologue by Mami Mi is actually boxing advice from Ashitano Joe. Most viewers who don't get the reference assume that Mami Mi is talking about baseball. And maybe she also thinks she's talking about baseball. Maybe she doesn't realize she's talking about a really popular shounen manga. And Naota asks if it's from a game. From this very simple interaction, mostly made of an Ashitano Do reference, we already get what kind of people they are. Mamimi is a confused and a rather confusing buffoon, and Naota is one of those kids who don't act like kids, or at least try not to act like one. This is once again supported by how he says he's doing homework beneath the bridge and not at his house because doing it at his house is not cool. From the low angle shots of Mamimi swinging the bat and the difference in their height and the way they carry themselves, you understand that Mamimi is older than Naota and their later physical interaction is made uncomfortable as a result of this. And with the awkward and uncomfortable interaction, you understand that their relationship is rather weird and complex than just friends. Mamimi asks why Naota always carries a baseball bat with him, although he never really plays. This sets up the backstory of his brother, and Mamimi forgetting why she's underneath the bridge when asked, and how she says she's gonna overflow, sets up how she doesn't have a home, or doesn't want to go home, and how she is emotionally unstable, something that would be explored in the next episode. How it goes introduction on how she can be seen spying on Naota and her nonchalantly biting into a bag of chips and her later interaction with Naota, or well, by interaction, I mean running him over, giving him quote unquote CPR, that borderline sexual assault, and hitting him over the head with her guitar along with her peculiar and very distinct gnarly voice indicating how she is not to be trusted, and also mystifying her character from the very beginning. And all this is the very first five minutes of the show. Also, this is essentially how the whole show is. Its pacing is fast and snappy and some might even say a little too fast and confusing. Thematically, this is very in place. Haruko's entrance is like the entrance of puberty in a child's life. It's all of a sudden and unforeseen. And yet, as Naota says in the opening moments, it's nothing, nothing amazing, only ordinary. ordinary. Each episode, Naota learns an important lesson. Before the entrance of Haruko, the tone of the show is laid back and aloof. Naota's all serious and up in his own head. Mamimi's melancholic and lethargic. And in comes Haruko. Tsurumaki says that Haruko beats Naota over the head because he's acting too much like an adult. Which is kind of contradictory, isn't it? I mean, Puberty is about becoming an adult. Why would a character who represents the unpredictable, illogical, and feral nature of puberty punish Naota for trying to achieve its own end goal? It's almost like becoming an adult isn't that simple, isn't it? Then why is that? Well, I know that I posed the question now, but I can't answer it now, or else the rest of the video is practically wordless, so stick around until the end, okay?
Tsurumaki once pointed out that there are two broad types of characters in the show. One, the right-handed people, like Naota and Mamimi, and most of the other characters as well. These people are imperfect, they act stupid and make bad decisions, they are immature and lost in life. And then there are the left-handed people, like Haruko and speculatively Naota's brother. They carry themselves with a mature and cool vibe. Although mature isn't exactly what you'd say for Haruko, you still think Haruko's cool. She's like that dude who's like the big brother in a friend group who acts really stupid but in the end, they are always the cool one. It all ties into the lesson FLCL is trying to teach. Carrying on with the first episode, Naota has a boner from his forehead. This theory arose from the fact that whenever he gets these boners or horns in all the other episodes, or at least whenever the horns transform into a mecha, or climaxes, I guess, he's in the presence of a girl. Not only so, after the first time, his brain cannot be seen on an x-ray, alluding to the fact that boners are hormonal and not dictated by consciousness. Hence, they make him dumb or brainless. <laughs> episode 2 is centered around Mamimi. At the end of episode 1, Naota breaks the fact that his brother's got an American girlfriend. Mamimi had feelings for Naota's brother, and it's not made clear, but they probably were dating before he went to America. And him going off to America and now getting a girlfriend there is obviously has not weighed well on her conscience. Earlier, Mamimi can be seen smoking a cigarette with the words never knows best on it. Although there have been many interpretations of what that means, such as it means that Mamimi never knows best or that she's depressed. It seems to be a random thing that the director wanted to put in and it would be far from being the first. In any case, it is times like these when people are desperate they do stupid things. And early on in this episode, Firestarter we can infer that Mamimi uses games as an escape from her feelings, and her emotional state can be at its peak after hearing the news at the end of the last episode. And so, what do people do at times like these? I need to be a little cautious as to the words I use, but they essentially subscribe to a delusion. Or, stay with me, join a religion. Now, religion is a big part of growing up. I personally was brought up in an atheist family and hold atheistic or agnostic beliefs myself, but when you look at the fact that the vast majority of people of the world are religious, you can easily see why religion is a big part of growing up. And at times of despair, Mamimi finds Kanti, or well, the robot that came out of Naruto's head that happened to do a cool pose and fly in front of Mamimi as the music peaked, and inspired by him, she sets fire to places. Hence the name of the episode, Firestarter. I'm not saying that this episode is a critique of religion, it is not. What it is, however, is now to learning to be there for someone who he cares about and who has turned to extremist delusions such as that of the violent video game and believing that Kanti is a god from that game as a result of her being uh, emotionally well, overflown. I say it's not a critique of religion because she still believes that Kanti is some kind of a god after the episode. Help! So she and Kanti climb the, the tower and, and she sits on top of her and yells this name out in a very, very cool scene and says that it's still worth doing so. Earlier in this episode, however, Naota smirkingly says that he's busy and that he needs to take care of people after all. I'm too busy. Yeah, you're always busy. Because there's a bunch of people I have to take care of. See ya! Again, thinking of himself as an adult, and then the show makes him realize that he wasn't taking care of people who actually needed taking care of. So, because he isn't an adult to begin with, as it's not really he who saves the day, but Kanti, who has had many parallels with Naoto's brother throughout the show. This episode is about him realizing that it's not the people who you think need help that actually need help, but maybe it's the people who you don't think need help that need help. <laughs> episode 3, on the other hand, 
isn't about Naota. It is about Nina Mori, Naota's classmate who's like Naota in that she too pretends to be an adult and to be calm and collected when she clearly isn't as seen in the climax of the episode. In this episode, a distinction is made between people who like spicy food and people who don't. Naota doesn't. His father and grandfather obviously don't. Haruko does, and Nina Mori however pretends to do so only for her to stop midway. Episode 3 takes the spotlight from Naota and gives it to Nina Mori to focus on the female puberty, hinted by how Nina Mori gets stomach aches after touching Naota's cat ears. Wow, that's a bizarre sentence. Speaking of bizarre sentences, a lot of FLCL's dialogue is made of sexual innuendos. Just listen to the scene where Haruko pulls out a guitar from Naoto's head while closing your eyes. Hey! Ugh. What are you doing to me? Just told uh, me. Uh, hey, I didn't know boys felt like this inside. Uh, don't touch me there from behind! <clears throat> you uh, easy! Oh, no. oh, uh, uh, oh. Wow, that sentence was even bizarre. Er, well, anyways, I'm getting off track. Nina Mori learns to stop pretending, or at least to start being a little more honest with herself and other people about her feelings. Notice how her stomach aches and her eventual transporting of a mecha out of her head only starts after her interaction with Haruko. Only that instead of a guitar, in the case of Naota, it's Naota's head that bashed into Nina Mori's forehead. Her own growth is only initiated by Haruko, the symbol for puberty. And in the end, she only started to grow the mecha out of her head after Naota escalated their argument by saying school plays are for kids, inadvertently calling Nina Mori a kid. And then she calls him a kid which made Naota slap Inamori's hat off her head, which surely leads to the transporting of the mecha. They are both obsessed with not being a kid. <laughs> Episode 4 introduces the character of Amma Rao, who seems to be, at first glance, an adult, like a proper one, mature, cool, and collected. But as we find out, he too is just as childish as every other adult character from the show. From his dialogue, he seems to have a similar experience with Haruko as Naota does. This episode also confirms the theory that the head boners are in fact boners. Because when Haruko uses Amarao's forehead, he could only produce a tiny guitar, alluding to, well, you know. This also explains why all the women in the HQ are bleeding from the nose when Haruko pulls out a big guitar from Naoto's forehead and Amarao says, but he's only a child. This episode is also subject to some weird Freudian theory. To be more exact, the Oedipus Complex. Naoto's jealousy to his father as a result of his father seemingly getting too close to Haruko leads him to seemingly murder his father at a moment's notice. Although he doesn't really murder his father because his father was already dead and then he rehydrates his decaying body and brings him back to life. This is fully cool, so I hope that you'd already gotten used to it by now. Again, killing his father was a brainless action he regrets the second after. Which hints that this too is connected to sexuality, which kind of confirms this episode's examination of the Oedipus Complex. Which if you don't know what it is, it's basically a theory made by another anime waifu named Sigmund Freud, who says that the reason why babies seem to be more attached to the parent of the opposite sex and seem to be aggressive to the parent of the same sex is because of sexual feelings towards the first parent. It isn't too alien in anime as Evangelion also alludes to this with Shinji's strange relationship with Misato who's a mother figure for him. And as Haruko here is over 20, well, yeah, I'm sorry you had to hear that. Episode 5 is probably the most bizarre out of the six, and I'd say the least I have to say about. It's about Naoto's grandiosity that materialized after him saving the city from a meteor bomb baseball thing last episode, or more specifically, breaking that grandiosity. And yeah, it's relatable, it's stupid and embarrassing watching Naoto blush at praises that he does only partly deserve. It is like that because you know that you have been in a situation like that before, right? You have, right? Or is it just me? Oh. The scene where he declares that this is me, Naota, 
and not his brother, illustrates his hypocrisy the most. He declares to Mami Me that it was him who saved the town as he climbs into Kanti. Kanti, so far, has been a sort of symbol for Naoto's brother. When Naoto enters Kanti, he can't really control him, and yet he says that he's a big deal with a bold face as he is entering Kanti, who is the actual big deal here? This episode also contains my favorite enemy mecha, it's the huge thing that's like a gunslinging western cowboy and it's also a disguise because it's actually a hand. It's just cool, okay? The last episode is the longest one out of the six and it's titled FLCL IMAX or FLCLIMAX. This is the episode where I think Naruto finally grows up. The whole anime has been leading to this and it does not disappoint. I think you've seen this incredible famous shot of Naruto looking up at the sky with a guitar on top of a hill of debris taken by Mami Me herself. And it's not just significant aesthetically because this is the shot where he finally grows up. All throughout the anime, there is this irrefutable conflict between the adult and the child. Every adult in this anime is childish and immature. Naruto's father, Kamon, is a self-serving, self-titled quote-unquote journalist who doesn't seem to care about his own son's wishes. This can be seen by how he allows Haruko to stay with them and then later quote-unquote gets closer to her even though his son doesn't really like it and acts really terrible to Ninamori after he writes a hit on her father. Amaral wears big stick-on eyebrows and again acts childishly all throughout episode 5 and 6. His officers too act stupid and again, childishly. And the same goes with Naoto's teacher, grandfather and all the other adults we see in the show. Even Mami Me who's 17 and almost an adult is selfish and does childish things. On the other hand, Naoto and Inamori are kids who act like adults. They try to suppress their feelings. They try to do the least selfish thing possible and be responsible. But in this state comes Haruko. Haruko's different. Yeah, she too does embarrassing and weird things all the time. She's loud and also selfish, but Haruko is always framed differently, isn't she? We never really laugh at her like we do Kamon or Naruto's grandfather or Naruto's teacher. The difference between Haruko and the other adults is that she doesn't hide behind the superficial title of an adult. She does what she feels like doing. She doesn't mask her feelings because she's supposed to be an adult. But what is an adult supposed to be? Well. To look at that, let's look at what a child is supposed to be. A child is a person who does not take responsibility. They are who do things that they want to do without restraint. They are selfish and irresponsible, like Haruko. And yet, Haruko is the agent of growing up, as alluded to by the fact that she's a sort of a symbol of puberty. Puberty is about growing up, isn't it? Well, no. The huge factory that can be seen from our town, the Medical Mechanica plant. All the adults got excited when it came here. Part 3. How to Grow Up Early in the first episode, Naruto says that all the adults were excited when Medical Mechanica came to town and built their huge iron factory. The iron factory is an unmistakable landmark of Mabase. Tsurumaki had the idea for it as a huge sci-fi iron that flattens all the creases of the earth. As Amaral puts it, the iron is used to smooth out the wrinkles in your brain so that you don't think. When you look at it like that, it's clear why adults love it. It eliminates free will. It kills creativity, hence everyone becomes subservient and responsible. Supposedly like an adult is supposed to do. Isn't this also what adults are when you are a kid? People who are over a certain age and go to work and talk about taxes and do a politic and drink coffee or other bitter stuff. People who barely do anything new and who stick to a boring routine for years on end. People who live grey lives. And if Medical Mechanica smooths out everybody's brains, then everyone will be an adult. There would be no fire starters, there would be no cool fools, there would be responsible adults. And Haruko poses a threat to this. She wants to free the Atomisk or the Pirate King, a being with an incredible amount of N.O. or, well, 
you know, the power to um, teleport stuff from the brain, like Naota. In the final battle, if you want to call it that, there is this moment where Naota is in the middle and is given a choice to go with Haruko or go with Amaral. Amaral says that Haruko is selfish and doesn't care about anyone but herself, and that Naota is different because he wants to take care of his friends and family. He wants to help them, and that's only normal. He'd understand it if he were an adult. Naota chooses Haruko's chaotic childishness over Amaral's fake adulthood. I say fake because Amaral just becomes a bystander, a commentator, a speed wagon. He, although being an adult, doesn't try to stop Naota. However, Haruko also doesn't get what she wanted either. Naota takes the Atomisk's power. Haruko has always wanted this power. The whole reason why she came to Mabase was for this power and Naota just took it. And he doesn't do it to save the world like Amarao wanted him to because that would be the responsible thing to do or because it's the right thing to do like an adult would. He did it just so that he could do this. I love you. <laughs> Naota took the power of an incredibly powerful being just so that Haruko would finally actually care about him for his sake for once so that he could confess his feelings. His actions did not help Amaral. Hell, they did not even help Haruko. They did not help his friends, but they did get him what he wanted to do, and that was to confess his feelings. It was childish and selfish. And notice how when this happens, we don't get now to side. When he's been privatized, he's stoic and cool and collected. And right after the fight, he picks up Haruko's guitar and we get this iconic scene. Look at how he's holding the guitar. Haruko's guitar is a left-handed guitar. And in the episode of Full Swing, we see that the guitar that Haruko pulls out of Naota's head for Naota is a right-handed one. In that episode, he swings the bat for the very first time in his life. And yet, it is only with Haruko's help that he was able to send the bomb flying away. A normal coming-of-age story would have ended with that episode, where he learns to be confident in himself and be cool and take initiative without being passive all the time. But he doesn't, because he only swam bad because he was forced to do it. And then in the next episode, he developed an immature grandiosity from it. But here, he quote unquote defeats Haruko by doing something incredibly childish and stupid. And in the end, he picks up Haruko's left handed guitar and learns to grow up. This is the message of FLCL that to be an adult is just to pass a certain age. Hence, coming of age. It's superficial. It is essentially like having an iron smooth your brain out and having it release steam all over so that you act on your responsibilities and forget how to feel and act on those feelings. Because being an adult does not make you a grown up, but it is only after embracing the fact that he's nothing but a child. It is only after now to learn to be a child by being selfish. By accepting to work on his own feelings and not others, he picks up Haruko's left-handed guitar. By stopping trying to be an adult and numbing out his feelings and starting to embrace the child in him and to listen to himself, he grows up. Uh, I can't drink that, it's too carbonated. You really are still kidding. Naruto's journey also coincides with Nietzsche's idea of the Ubermensch. The Ubermensch, or the Overman, or the Superman, according to Nietzsche, is the evolution of the modern man. He's the man who's transcended the herd, and all in all is a desirable man. So how does one achieve this evolution? In his book, Thaspo Zarathustra, Nietzsche says that a man should go through a three-step metamorphosis of overcoming oneself. In the beginning, the person is a camel, a subservient being who obeys other people and societal norms and doesn't do anything individualistic or creative and kneels to an unquestionable authority like Naota at the beginning, trying to be an adult and trying to do what he thinks adults are supposed to do. 
like all the other adults in the show. And then he becomes the lion. He breaks free of his authority and starts to think for himself. Not only reaches this stage by the last episode, he leaves his class, he leaves his friends and runs away with Haruko. He begins to think for himself. But that's still not it, is it? This process will only end when he discovers what he wants to do rather than what others want him to. And this final form is called the child. The lion can only become a child when he defeats the dragon of Thou Shalt, the dragon which tells him what to do. In the last episode, although he becomes a lion, he still goes with Haruko not realizing she's using him. And at the climax of this last episode, Naruto defeats this dragon by not following Amara's instructions and also betraying Haruko by taking the Atomisk's power for himself. Here, he realizes what he wanted to do and does it. And through this journey, he becomes a child. He grows up, he overcomes himself. And this is what puberty is about. Puberty isn't about being an adult. It's about being a child. FLCO asks you to be more truthful to yourself, to be a little more selfish, a little more childish, because that is how you really grow up. There is no meaning to growing up. There is no one way to growing up. To grow up is to define growing up yourself. Growing up is not by sticking on big eyebrows and telling yourself to obey the societal responsibilities and not to question them, but by listening to your feelings and questioning generally accepted social norms and actually pursuing what you want to do. When you look at FLCL like this, it's hard not to see Tsurumaki himself in Naoto's journey. As I described before, Tsurumaki was thrust into the production of The End of Evangelion, and after FLCL, he'd go on to direct Die Buster, a sequel to an already established and also a sort of iconic Gunbuster. And after that, he'd be given the director seat on the Evangelion Rebuild series. And so, looking at his directorial works, it's only FLCL that stands out. Even for the cast, as I said earlier, FLCL was a way to experiment and discover themselves artistically. Like Naota, Tsurumaki had his own journey to becoming a child through the illogical randomness of FLCL. And after that, he'd go on to deal with much more adult works like the Rebuild series. I said in the beginning that no one understands fully coolly, and that still holds true. I have no idea what Naoto's dad being replaced by a mannequin or what the Atomisk and the power of the NO are supposed to mean. Maybe they don't even mean anything at all. But in a similar vein, no one really understands growing up. No one really understands puberty. It's fast and random and confusing and stupid. But at the end of the day, it happens to everyone. It's nothing amazing, only the ordinary. I'd like to end this video with a quote from Tsurumaki in an interview where he was asked what he thinks truly growing up is. He says, Oh no. I really don't know, but I'll start off by saying this, let us all become children. Before I end this off, I just like to say that um, Nietzsche's philosophy is often misinterpreted by a lot of misogynists and, and often fascist ideologues like, you know, the Nazis. So I'd be wary if I were to search up or learn more about Nietzsche. Which you should do despite the fact. With that said, thank you a lot for watching this video. And yeah, subscribe and comment 